That song either produces tears or goosebumps, and I have goosebumps right now. It's a powerful song. I want to share with you a verse that gave me some goosebumps last week when I read it. Last week around 2.30, Friday afternoon, Nikki showed me a verse. Nikki has been using her cell phone with her UVerse Bible app, and she's acting surprised right now that I'm mentioning this. I already told her I was going to talk about her a little bit. In the UVerse Bible app, there are different devotionals that you can go through. She showed me a passage that when I saw it, I said, wait a second, am I actually reading the Bible? Because I don't recall reading this text in the past. And when I saw it, it gave me goosebumps, and it gave me a lot of confidence, and I believe it's going to change my life forever, and hopefully it will change your life forever too. The passage I'm referring to is found in the Old Testament, in a book that maybe we don't take the time to read as much as we should, the book of 2 Samuel chapter 23. If you have your Bible, turn over there to 2 Samuel chapter 23. I have read this chapter in the past, but I believe, I think I kind of stopped short. I don't think I went all the way through the chapter. I know in 2 Samuel chapter 23, in the first couple of verses, it talks about the last words of King David. David talked about how he was inspired, how the Spirit gave him the words to say, the words to speak. Yet there is a verse In verse number 20, and I want to introduce you to a man and something that this man did that really has changed me and hopefully will change you as we talk about this unique passage. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, 23, in verse number 20, it says, Then Benaiah. Now some may say Benaiah, Benaniah. Max is already smiling at me. I said, look, I I did my research and I think you pronounce his name Benaiah. Max said, every time you say Benaiah, I'm going to say Benaiah. So I said, I may just change his name to Benjamin, okay? So Benjamin. No, that's not what it says. Benaiah. But I may change my name to Benaiah. Then Benaiah, the son of Jehida, the son of a valiant man of Kabzil, what an interesting place, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. Have you ever read that passage before in your Bible? This man, Benaiah, or Benaiah, and I don't even know how to call his name, this man went down into a pit and killed a lion on a snowy day. When I read that, I got to tell you, I was really amazed. I had not read this before, or if I had, I guess I forgot about it, but I, am, I was amazed, I was shocked that a man would actually go down into a pit, close quarters, and kill a lion on a snowy day. We could say the fact that he went down into the pit, the fact that he went after that lion, that he chased the lion, which is an amazing and fascinating thing to consider, isn't it? Two years ago, when me, Max, Clarence, and Terry went to Africa, we went to a restricted lion preserve, and we were able to see these massive animals, these predators, and they are amazing creatures. Now, we were in this nice little booth or porch or whatever you want to call it that had us in, and then there was like, I think it was an electric fence. It was, am I right? There was an electric fence, so we were a pretty good distance away. There were two men who went into the gate, and they had to feed the lions, now, there weren't any, the lions were not around at that time, but what they did, they had this pickup truck, they had this huge dead bull, and one of the men, they got the bull out of the truck, they attached it to a tree with a chain, and while one of the guys was doing that, the other guy was, was looking out. He was looking to the right like the entire time. And they did it so quickly, and then they got out. You know why, right? They did not have to whistle to these animals, say, okay, it's, it's time to come and eat. About 60 seconds later, I have the video. You see this massive male lion with his huge mane and these huge paws walk out. And there's about 16 other lions that walk out, and you just see them destroy that dead bull. It was amazing. Now, why am I saying all of that? I'm saying that because we were watching this from afar. We didn't want to have any business with those animals. But Benaiah, in the text, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, it says that he went down into the pit on a snowy day, and he killed a lion. And in a sense, his going after this lion represents chasing a lion. 
It's an interesting passage, and this is the only verse. There's a parallel text in 1 Chronicles that talks about this too, but we don't really have any more information. But our imaginations can run wild with this one verse. I mentioned just a moment ago that lions can weigh, on average, about 400 pounds. They can run fast, 20, 30 miles an hour. They can leap. These are vicious animals. They are experts in hunting their prey. And yet what we find is that this man went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Benea, was he, was he cold? Was he stiff? Was he nervous? Was he thinking as he went down into this pit, why am I doing this? And what was his motivation behind it? Was this lion, had it been a menace, had it been chasing him, had it been stalking him? Just imagine walking to that pit or wherever the pit or however it may have looked like, did he see the footprints or the paw prints in the snow? When he went down into the pit, did he see that fierce animal staring back at him? Did he attack him from behind? We don't have all of those details, but when you think about what this man did, it really is amazing. And it's amazing because when you think about some of the other stories in the Bible, other stories that give us details about these vicious animals. Remember the story in the book of Daniel. I believe we're in Daniel right now. In our Bible reading, Daniel was thrown into the, the lion's pit. And God protected him. He preserved him. But those who had conspired against Daniel, they were thrown into the pit. And before they even hit the ground, they were what? They were killed. They were crushed. Their bones were crushed. Or what about Samson in the book of Judges? Samson, he was a mighty man also. Samson killed a lion with a, with a skull of an animal, I believe a donkey's head. And so we read about these different stories, and yet this one is interesting here because this man jumped into the pit, and he killed a lion on a snowy day. And that's not even all of the verse. Look back in verse number 20. It says that he was the son of a valiant man of Kabzil who had done mighty deeds. So we don't even know all the things that he had done in his life. He killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab. Some translations may say lion-like men. In other words, that these men were, these men were massive or big or, or, or just like a lion, fierce and ferocious. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. Look at verse 21. He killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Some translations will say that he was a handsome man. Now, the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a club. Watch this. Snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. So think about that for a second. Benea, he's facing this Egyptian man. The man has a spear. He takes it and then uses it to kill him. And by the way, right in your Bible, next to that verse, 1 Chronicles 11, this Egyptian man was 7 feet 5 inches. And Benea said, ah, big deal, I've already killed a lion. I can take care of you. That's not all. Look at the next verse in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Look at verse number, number 22. These things Benaiah the son of Jehida did and had a name as well as the three mighty men. When you look at this chapter here, beginning in verse 8, you have all of these details of, of men who worked with King David. You have these 30 powerful men, these warriors. You had some men who were unnamed. They went around with David. They were with King David in his battles. They protected David. They fought for Israel. And so we see here that Benaiah, he was named among the three mighty men. He was honored, verse 23, among the 30, but he did not attain to the three. And David appointed him over his guard. And so we see here, this is really the beginning of this man, Benaiah. He killed a lion on a snowy day. He now is now promoted to guard over David's army. And in 1 Chronicles and in 1 Kings, we see that eventually he would be appointed over 24,000 men. And then after David died in 1 Kings chapter 2, it would be Solomon who would appoint him over his army. This was an impressive man. This was a fearless man. This was a courageous man. This was a man who provided a lot of blessings for others. Now, somebody may be thinking, all right, this is a great story. The next time I have a junior high Devo, maybe I'll share it with them. Or this is great Bible trivia when somebody comes over to my house next week or something like that. But how does it apply to me? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. The title of my lesson is called Chase the Lion. And Chase the Lion has kind of become my new tagline or phrase, whatever you want to call it. Chasing lions, my friends, is about being fearless. It's about being courageous. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christians, we have to be fearless. We need to be courageous. It's interesting. I've been reading some books about 
uh, just about the human mind. And it's been said, I read it twice now. It's been said that babies are born with two fears. You know what those two fears might be? The fear of falling and noise. And I think that's correct because when people get older, what do they become afraid of typically? Falling and loud noise. So why is it that so many times we live our lives full of fear? We're afraid of so many things in our lives. We're afraid to talk to the person at job, at the job. We're afraid sometimes to maybe have a crucial conversation with one another. Some of us are afraid to swim. Others are afraid to fly. Others are afraid to drive. Some are afraid to get out of their house. Some are afraid of so many things. There are some people who would rather be six feet in the grave, die, have their family have to plan a funeral than to be up here and do what I'm doing right now. The fear of public speaking is the number one fear, and the second fear is death. So people would rather die than speak in public. Why are we so afraid so many times? Well, we pick up these references along the way in our lives. And yet the more I think about it, I think about Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. The only fear probably we need to have is our fear for God. Fear God and keep his commandments. As brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christians, we need to be fearless. We need to be courageous in everything that we do. But so many times as Christians, we allow fear to shackle our lives, to prevent us, or that prevents us from fighting for what is right, for doing the will of God. And so we need to have this idea like Benaya, Benaya, to chase the lion, to dive into a pit, to face obstacles, to face challenges, and to trust in our true and living God. Benaiah faced many physical battles, and he was victorious. We are going to face many spiritual battles, and we will be victorious because of our Father in heaven. But if we're going to be victorious, we have to be fearless, and we have to be courageous, and we have to be bold, and we have to trust in God like never before in our lives. And so I want to talk for a few minutes this morning about this idea. What might this look like of chasing the lion? Well, Christians, and I want to give you two examples. I think there are a lot of examples that we could use. But first, I want you to notice that Christians need to chase the lion with respect to evangelism. My friends, when it comes to reaching the lost, we need to chase the lion. We need to be fearless. We need to be courageous when it comes to doing God's great work. I hesitate sometimes to talk about this because... We have done such a great job here at Dallin Road with respect to evangelism and reaching the lost. We've had four precious souls that were saved this past week because of Jesus Christ and the power of his blood. And yet we need to be reminded that we need to chase the lion when it comes to evangelism. I've had the privilege, and Max and David have had the privilege of going to other congregations and helping them with respect to evangelism and helping them to, to reach the lost. There are a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ who are interested in going out into the community and teaching people about Jesus. And brothers and sisters, the more I talk to people and look at churches, there are a lot of churches that are on the decline. And it's because brethren are not reaching out and talking to others. And it's not because the Bible is not powerful or God's word is not powerful. It's not because we don't have enough workbooks or because we haven't heard enough sermons on this. I believe it's often because of fear. Fear often holds back. Christians from doing the work of God. But I want you to see in the book of Acts, turn over to Acts chapter 8, I want you to see how in the first century, the saints in the first century, they were fearless, they were courageous, and that is the mentality that we have to have. We are involved in God's great work, we have work to do, we are on a mission, and nothing can get in our way. Nothing can get in our way, no one can get in our way. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1, I want you to see how these Christians... They did not allow fear. They did not allow any obstacles to get in their way. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 1, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, talking about Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He put them in prison. Therefore, those who have been scattered went about, watch this, they went about preaching the word. Isn't that amazing? Their brother, Stephen, was killed. Paul is going into their home, snatching them out and throwing them into prison. And yet these brothers and sisters in Christ, they said, we're going to keep on doing the work of God. 
They trusted in God. They were fearless, and that's a mentality that we have to have. I want you to notice in Acts chapter 17, we see that the apostle Paul, he would often go down into the pit of the lion or into the lion's den. In Acts 17, we find that in one case, Paul went into the synagogue. This is what he did numerous times when he went from city to city. He went into the synagogue, and he talked to the religious experts. He talked to the Jewish leaders, and he went toe-to-toe with them and explained to them who Jesus is. In Acts 17, in verse number 2, it says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And the result of that, the result of him being fearless, the result of him being courageous and having enough faith to tell somebody else about Jesus, it says some of them were persuaded. Some of them were persuaded. Great things happened. Because he had this chase the lion mentality. He was fearless. He was courageous. Nothing was going to get in the way of him accomplishing the work of God. Later on in the same chapter, I want you to notice in verse number 22. Paul was in Athens, and in verse number 22, we find that he went toe-to-toe with those philosophers. Yeah, these may have been the elite at that time. They They may have been the ones who were considered to be wise. But Paul had the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was nothing or no one that was going to get in his way. The Bible says in verse 22, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Paul said, I need to tell you the truth because I have the gospel of Jesus Christ. He had that chase the lion mentality, and nothing was going to get in his way. Paul did not retreat. He went after, and he shared the good news of Jesus. Now, some may look at Paul and may say, well, he only converted a few people in Athens. Only a couple of people were saved. Well, folks, if there's one person that's saved, that is a blessing. And that's exactly what happened. So it doesn't matter if there are 3,000 souls that are saved, or a couple of hundred people, or one soul. When a soul is saved, that is always a blessing in the eyes of God. And when it comes to evangelism for us, my friends, we have to have that mentality. Chase the lion. We have to be fearless and courageous. And the question is, are we? I know that we are doing great work here, and yet we have so much more to do. And I want you to really think about this. Think about the odds that people would put on Benaiah. He's going down into a pit with a lion, okay? Okay. And most of the time, the lion is going to win, all right? And yet he came out victorious. You see, it doesn't matter what the circumstances may be. It doesn't matter if we may be outnumbered as Christians in this world that we live in today. It doesn't matter because we have King Jesus on our side. And because King Jesus is on our side, we are going to be victorious. But that's going to require fearlessness on our part. That's going to require courage on our part. And when we do that, we'll see the power of God. It is amazing looking throughout the Old Testament and seeing how God moved on behalf of his people. In Judges chapter 3 and verse 31, there's an example there. There's a man by the name of Shamgar, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And it said that he killed 600 Philistines by himself. He saved Israel. He killed 600 Philistines by himself with an ox goad. I asked Max, what is an ox goad? It's like a spear or some type of stick. But think about that. 600 men and one man took out 600 men? That's fearlessness right there. And when it comes to going out into the world, we have to have that mentality. I think about Gideon in Judges chapter 7. Remember Gideon? God said, I'm going to give you victory over the Midianites. But I want to show you, I'm going to show you that it's only because of me that you are going to be victorious. And so he told Gideon to tell those men who were fearful and trembling, you go home. And 22,000 men went home that day. God said, if you're fearful and trembling, just go home. You see, what God wants of us, he wants us to be fearless. He wants us to be courageous. He wants us to go out into the world, speak out for Jesus, share our faith with others, stand firm on God's word. There is no reason Christians should ever walk on eggshells around people because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We have the truth. And because we have the truth and because we have a victorious king, don't ever be ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ. Shine your light and share your faith with others and don't bow down to fear and worry. 
That is how, my friends, we chase the lion. We do so when it comes to evangelism, and we do so when it comes to our relationship in this church. I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 6. Chasing the lion is the idea of being fearless. It's the idea of being courageous. It's the idea of being bold. And when it comes to our relationship, our theme this year has been we are family, and we've done sermons dealing with family, and we've had a Bible class dealing with love in the local church. As Christians, we need to chase the lion when it comes to our relationships as brothers and sisters in Christ. There is another lion that I have not mentioned yet that is found in the scriptures, right? 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 talks about who? The devil, and he's described as a roaring lion. And what the devil wants us to do as God's people, he wants us to run in fear when it comes to evangelism. You know what he wants us to do with our relationships? He wants to create havoc among God's people. That's what he does. That's what he wants us to do. But when that lion roars, my friend, we don't run away. We stand and we fight. And I want you to notice in Acts chapter 6, this is interesting here because it's talking about the church in Jerusalem. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, so great things were taking place in this congregation, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked and the daily serving of food. God, or the devil would often attack God's people either from without, with persecution, like we saw in Acts chapter 8, and if that didn't work, then he would try to get them to become divided from within. This congregation was growing, the church in Jerusalem, and then we see that there were some problems that arose. Well, what do the people of God do? Well, they fight. They fight the good fight. They're fearless. They have to be courageous in a time like this, and that's exactly what we see. Look at verse number two. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. The apostle says, okay, look, guys, We're going to get this problem fixed, and we're going to get it fixed right now. We're not going anywhere. We're going to get this problem fixed right now. He said, look, we have a focus, and we're going to make sure that we stay on track. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. You see, the apostles, they had this crucial conversation. There was a problem that arose, and they had two choices. They could run away from the roar of the devil. Or they can say, okay, we're going to get this fixed, and we're going to be bold and courageous. And that's exactly what they did. They handled the problem the right way, and that took a lot of courage. That took a lot of strength and courage and fearlessness. Think about all the people in that one congregation. And this could have been devastating to that congregation, and yet the apostles said, we're going to stand fast upon the word of God. Chase the lion is the mentality that when problems arise, we don't run away, my friends, but we face them and we overcome them together. But that reminds, or that requires courage in our relationships to handle challenges and obstacles the proper way. In every local church, every local church, there are always going to be some issues. There will be some problems from time to time. It doesn't matter if there's a church of 3,000 people, 300 people, or 30 people. There will be problems that will arise from time to time. And when that happens, we have to have that chase the lion mentality that we're going to be courageous and we're going to stand firm upon the word of God. Shepherds and local congregations have to be courageous and stand firm upon the word of God. I want you to notice in Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20, as Paul was leaving Ephesus, he gathered those shepherds up one last time. He reminded them about who they were. He reminded them about their responsibility. And he reminded them that they're going to have to be bold and courageous because sometimes they would have to dive or jump into a pit on a snowy day in battle. They would have to battle for the people of God. In Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28, it says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to the shepherd, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Folks, look, in every congregation, there are going to be challenges that are going to arise. That happened in Jerusalem. It happened in Ephesus. We can't be surprised when we have challenges today. And yet what we have to do, we have to be bold and courageous and stand firm upon the word of God. As Paul was talking to these apostles or shepherds, he said, And from among you, verse 30, your own selves, men, will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. 
You see, that's how the devil often works, that roaring lion. If he can't destroy us from without, then he's going to try his best to destroy us from within. And when that happens, my friends, we need to chase the lion mentality where we are fearless, where we are courageous, and where we handle problems God's way. And when we do that, my friends, great things will happen. Shepherds here are engaged in many spiritual battles. Paul showed us that these shepherds were engaged in spiritual battles, and shepherds often will get tired. And I'm sure Benea got tired. But what he had to do, he had to continue to fight the good fight. And shepherds have to do that also. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what we have to have, we have to have the chase the lion mentality. And I want you to listen very carefully here. We have to have the courage to fight for one another, not against one another. We have to have the courage to fight for one another, not against one another. Your battle is never against me, per se, or me against you, but it's against that devil, the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we forget about him sometimes. If he can't defeat us from the outside, then he's going to try his best to defeat us from the inside. And that's why we got to have the chase the lion mentality where we are fearless, courageous, and we're going to trust in God, stand fast on his word no matter what. So we got to have the courage to fight for one another, not against one another. This is not a battle against one another. This is a spiritual battle that's taking place. And I will tell you, it can get tough sometimes. But you see these one another passages. Turn over to Galatians chapter 6. This is what it's all about, folks. It's not beating people up. It's not about beating me or anything like that or someone else. It's about helping one another. This is what we are called to do. And we got to have this chase the lion mentality. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul said, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself. So that, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. You see, there's, there's a one another passage there. Bear one another's burdens and therefore, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. That's what it's all about, folks. It's about helping one another, not trying to defeat one another. And sometimes, you know what that's going to require from you and from me? That's going to require a lot of courage. That's going to require a lot of fearlessness. Look over in Galatians chapter 2. We read this so many times. I'm just going to look at verse number 11. Remember when Paul had to confront Peter? In Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Think about that for a second. Paul called out of due season, the last of all, to see Jesus Christ. He's standing before one of the pillars of the church. And he said, I had to call him out. I had to help him. Why? Not because he wanted to hurt him but rather he wanted to save him. He stood condemned. And Paul had that chase the lion mentality. He had to say something. And that required courage on his part. That required having a fearless type of mentality. And my friends, that's what we got to have. Because there is the roaring lion, the devil, who was seeking to devour us and what he wants us to do he wants us to devour one another as Paul talked about to avoid this in Galatians chapter 5 and so we must have the courage to truly we got to have the courage to chase the lion to dive into the pit on a snowy day and to battle for one another we got to have the courage and fearlessness to truly forgive one another as Jesus has forgiven us that's what Paul talked about in Colossians chapter 3. We have to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. And we must remember that the enemy is always the devil. Our enemy is the devil, folks. And what the devil wants us to do, he wants us to run. He wants us to gossip. He wants us to judge according to appearance. He wants us to hold grudges. But the Holy Spirit says, you resolve issues the right way. Last time I checked, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, kindness. See, that's how we resolve issues. Go back to Acts chapter 6. You see, when we have this mentality, this chase the lion mentality, that we're not opposed to one another, we're, we're all on the same team. When we are fearless and courageous and recognize, you know what, sometimes we're going to have to say some things, sometimes we're going to have to have a crucial conversation, sometimes we're going to have to have a face-to-face -face talk, and we're going to get it fixed the right way. Great things will happen. Look back in Acts chapter 6. You see, a, a, a complaint arose in Acts chapter 6. And the apostles said, look, here's what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. The congregation bought into it. Now look at verse number 7. The word of God kept on spreading. 
And a number of the disciples continued to increase, increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. You see how that works? They stood fast in the word of God, and they were bold and courageous. And as a result, great things took place. My friends, that is how we chase the lion. That is the chase the lion mentality. We need to do that, and that's an interesting text too because it says that a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. They would continue to do the work of God, and their relationship stayed intact because they were fearless and courageous. So how do we do all of this? Well, to wrap all of this up, if we're going to be successful, if we're going to chase the lion, it will require intense focus on our part like we have never had before in our lives. It will require that we draw closer to our king more than ever. It will require that we get down on our knees more than ever, that we stay in a constant prayer mode. We are reminded in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 and 18, that we need to pray without ceasing. And we need to increase our prayers. We need to increase our faith. And that requires more time on our part, but that is how we're going to be able to chase the lion. That is how we're going to have that mentality. To defeat our fears and obstacles, we're going to have to pray fervently. I want you to quickly turn back to Psalm chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse number 3 in Psalm chapter 5. I told you that Benaiah and these other men and Samuel... They were the men of David. They were with David. They fought with David. And I want you to think about something here. This is interesting because in Psalm 5, we see David was a man of prayer. In Psalm 5, in verse 3, it says, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. David consistently prayed to his Father in heaven. He had his hour of power. He prayed early in the morning. And that's the type of mentality that we have to have. Think about this. Did Benea see his king on his knees praying early in the morning? And how would that have affected him and his relationship with God? Well, I'll tell you, my friends, we have seen our king praying early in the morning in Mark 1, verses 34 and 35. And if our king, Jesus, did that while he was here on earth, then, my friends, we need to have that prayer mentality. We need to pray like we have never prayed before in our lives. That is how we're going to chase the lion. That is how we're going to be fearless. That is how we're going to be courageous. If we're going to chase the lion, it means that we replace our fears with more faith. No more fears. We allow fear to hold us back so much when things need to be said, when actions need to be done, when people need to be saved, when relationships need to be mended. No more fear, folks. Chase the lion. and Let's fix the things that we need to get done. As disciples, we need to get out of the boat like Peter did. Remember when Peter got out of the boat? We give him a bad rap because when he got out of the boat, what quickly happened? He quickly began to sink. But you know what? At least he got out of the boat. Where were the other 11? They were in the boat. They were like, I'm not getting out of that boat. He got out of the boat. That man had great faith. That's the kind of faith that we need. And when we have that kind of faith and keep our eyes on Jesus, great things will happen. So many people today don't want to do anything sometimes with evangelism because they're afraid of failure. But you know what? If you talk to somebody and they don't come to services, or they don't have a Bible study, or you don't get a Bible study set up with them, or they maybe reject the study or reject God's word. My friends, that is not a failure on your part. You know what may be a failure? Not saying anything. All the opportunities that we have sometimes in our families, forget about whether or not you're outnumbered. You have Jesus on your side. So sometimes, maybe we need to rethink how we look at failure. Don't be afraid to fail. It's going to happen. Paul only converted a few people. Many people rejected Jesus. Our responsibility is to go out and give people an opportunity, which means that we're going to have to launch out into the deep. We're going to have to jump out of the boat and trust in Jesus. We need to delete the fouls of fear in our minds and replace them with God's word, which means that we're going to have to be in the word of God a lot more. That is how our minds are going to be transformed and renewed on a daily basis. And ultimately, as we pray and as we read, We ultimately, my friends, have to trust our king. We need to believe in our king and do anything for our king. Benaiah, this man served the king. He would do anything for his king. He would fight for his king. He would battle for his king. He would die for his king. What about us? Our king is Jesus. Will we fight the good fight for him? 
Will we be fearless and courageous for him? That is what he has called us to do. We need to chase the lion. And when we do, expect great blessings to occur. That's the idea of chasing the lion. So one last question. Is there something in your life right now that you need to chase? Is there a situation that maybe you need to dive into that pit fearlessly and courageously? No more fear, folks. No more worry. We need to trust in our king and know that he will always be with us. Let's walk by faith, my friends. If there is someone here today who is not a child of God, the devil, the roaring lion, he does not want you to act right now. He wants you to sit there and fear and doubt and not do what you know you may need to do. You need to be saved. You need to come to the lion from the tribe of Judah, and you need to be converted. You need his blood. You need to be saved. You need the remission of your sins. Is there someone here who knows Jesus, who believes that he is the Son of God, who has read about him in the Gospels, willing to make the confession that he is the Son of God, willing to turn away from sins and be immersed in water? Are you ready to do that? Conquer your fears. Jesus is the one that can help you. If you're subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as we sing.